murder mystery with household items. Who is dead? Not the mop. Should have cleaned up your act earlier. Who found the deceased mop? It was not Mr. Clean. The milk and the milk done spilled the tea. <laughs> Who do they put on this case? Who is investigating the death of the mop? The piggy bank. That's rich. Milk says they saw someone leaving the scene of the crime. The refrigerator. That refrigerator is running and y'all better go catch it. Who's actually the lead suspect in Piggy Bank's investigation though? The camera. You gonna snitch on yourself. They check camera's memory cards and confirm they're not the killer, but they find an incriminating picture of Mop and the real killer. That's why we don't trust pigs around here. kid is old enough to ask a question, they're old enough to know the answer at an age appropriate level. I think of it like math. I mean, at some point in your life, you learn how to do long division, but you don't start there. Like if a five-year-old hears about long division and they ask, how do I do long division? You're not going to say you're too young for that, even though they are. But you might say it's a type of math and for math, we need numbers. So let's work on counting. By giving them some information, we're creating building blocks for future conversations. Is it always easy to come up with an age appropriate answer? No, but that doesn't mean it isn't worth it. And of course, sometimes their questions require follow-up questions. So you really know what they're asking and also maybe where did you hear that? But I always answer my kids' questions to the best of my ability because I would always rather them get correct information from me than just believe whatever they hear on the playground. As an added bonus, if you answer their questions, they feel comfortable asking you questions and that's good for trust. I always tell my kids that uncomfortable conversations are worth having and sometimes I'm the uncomfortable one, but that's all right. Okay, bye. <laughs> you can ignore this part. I just need this to be longer than 60 seconds. So this is glitter, floppa, syrup, pancake, and maple. Okay, bye. In today's episode of Oh My God, The American Medical System, I just got off of an appointment with a new psychiatrist and I made apparently the cardinal mistake of saying, hey, my therapist suggested that maybe I should get tested for autism. And this man, this man laughed. He laughed. We've, had, we've, we've spoken very little. You know so little about me so far. He asked me no questions yet. And he laughed and he said, do you have friends? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you have a lot of friends? And I said, I have a medium amount of friends. And he goes, okay, then you can scratch that out of your brain. You don't have autism. And I went, what? And he said, autistic people don't have a lot of friends. And I was like, I, I, I don't think you can say that. And he was like, what? It's just true. Autistic people just don't have friends. They're not able to socialize like that. And I was like, I need you to stop what you're saying right now because that is so inappropriate. He didn't ask me, hey, why do you think that you might, why does your therapist think that you might? And anytime I brought up my therapist, the man scoffed at me. I said, my therapist put me through a test for CPTSD. And he said, uh, it's PTSD. And yes, I know the DSM doesn't recognize CPTSD. I know. He continued to treat me like a junkie while I was trying to get my ADHD medication, even though I already have a diagnosis from elsewhere and I only take it teensy tiny bit of it anyways. My prescription lasts me three months. And this man laughed at me. He laughed at me when I said, hey, I'd like to get tested for autism. Lift your hands when I say thank you. It's a solo, God's using me. Don't sing with me right now, Lord. You know, capitalist society, especially the kind of market-oriented one that we are living in now, unless all citizens know at least some economics, democracy is meaningless. Yeah, yeah now everything has to justify its uh, existence at, uh, in terms of money. Yeah? So liter uh, literary festivals, yeah? teaching of uh, the ancient languages in universities, yeah? preservation of uh, cultural heritage. You know, I've even met some British people who try to defend the British monarchy by arguing that it brings in tourist revenue. I'm not a monarchist, actually I'm an anti-monarchist, but what a demeaning, ridiculous way of trying to justify an institution that you think is at the foundation of your society. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's come to that. Yeah, so in that kind of world, if people don't know about the economics, voting is like voting in X factors. Yeah? You know, I still remember back in 2000, a lot of Americans that voted for George W. Bush arguing that 
you know, he looks like a kind of guy that I could ever beer with, yeah? Well, on that qualification, I could become the president of the United States because I don't mind having beer with anyone, yeah? <laughs> But what a way to voting in someone into the most powerful political office in the world, yeah? So I, I really think that we all need to the, the, the learn economics. Unfortunately, economics is dry, boring, you know, uninteresting, yeah? So I'm, I'm uh, trying to uh, perk it up. If you want my pronouns, I'm the man, I'm the man who don't respect Let's look at the stats, I've got the facts, my money like Liz, so my pockets are fat. Homie, I'm epic, don't be a whap, dog, it's a yarmulke, homie, no cap. Why did eating with your hands get deemed uncivilized in the Western world? Most of the world actually ate with their hands until around the 1800s. Prior to that, utensils were really only used for cooking and ladling communal foods. From England to India, from the rich to the poor, most people ate with their hands. But when forks became popular amongst royalty in countries like France, all of a sudden there was a push from the upper class to separate themselves from the animals and savages and civilize themselves through food etiquette. While utensils became the norm throughout much of the Western world, many cultures have continued to enjoy food with their hands. Various African, Indian, East Asian, Middle Eastern countries. And there are scientifically proven benefits to eating with your hands. It is said to help pace your eating, help you eat more consciously. It is said to better aid in digestion as your body can actually evaluate foods based on touch. Many experts believe that food is one of the few things that should be experienced with all five senses for a deeper, more enjoyable experience. Taste, of course. Smell. Sight. How does the food look? But also sound. Sounds of chewing and swallowing. Sounds of people enjoying their meal. And touch. Helping your body understand the texture, the temperature, and literally connecting you to the food. All of that impacts the experience of your meal. Do you enjoy eating with your hands? So do you know about these elite exclusive clubs made specifically for the descendants of white colonizers? So I'm about to tell you might piss you off, but I think you deserve to know about something called lineage organizations because they really expose the hypocrisy of the whole anti-DEI, slavery was so long ago, we need to return to a meritocracy crowd of white Americans. Because last time I checked, getting into elite societies based on your great, 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 great grandparents' decision to colonize the United States isn't meritocratic. So let's talk about it. So lineage organizations or hereditary societies are social clubs where the proven descendants of certain historical groups meet, have these huge events, and carry out various projects throughout the country. But the historical Local groups in question are usually just the forefathers of white elites. For example, there's a Mayflower Society which was founded in 1897 and requires direct proof of lineage from one of the passengers of the Mayflower that arrived in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And these organizations have both internal and external power. Daughters of the American Revolution, for example, is open to women who can prove their direct lineage to people who fought in the American Revolutionary War, and in it were people like former First Lady Laura Bush, suffragist Susan B. Anthony, and Senator Tammy Duckworth. And last but not least in this video, we have the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which you get into if your ancestors fought for the South in the Civil War. And as you can see here, they were hugely responsible for erecting Confederate monuments throughout the country and pushing the lost cause myth that the Civil War was about states' rights and not the preservation of the racist system of slavery. And there are like 300 others that exist. So even though many Americans still deny that the same racist power structures that created the country have any bearing on today, Lineage organizations are perhaps the most in-your-face display that in actuality, people are still reaping the benefits of their white supremacist ancestors in the most explicit way possible. But did you know about these? Let me know in the comments and follow for more. One year ago, a stranger on the internet stalked me and outed me to my father on Facebook. The way that he outed me was by saying, your daughter is faking having autism online and begging for money for a service dog and sent him my profile. Now, my father knows I'm autistic and knows that my dog was getting service dog trained because my dog was wandering around in a red service dog and training vest and my mom was taking me to the training session. However, my father is extremely far right and delusional. So when my mom told him about my autism diagnosis a few years ago, he was so angry because autism isn't real in his little mind. Now, the problem wasn't me having an autism page. It's the main reason why this bitter white man sent my father my TikTok. Because I had posted a Get Ready With Me video talking about my sexuality. I grew up in a very conservative Christian household with parents who refused to go to Home Depot back in the day because Home Depot supported gay marriage. So obviously he shows my mom and she's also super angry. The you've dated men before, no you're not, this is disgusting. Which I still like men unfortunately, I'm just saying I like women too. But what blows my mind is that I'm an adult. I was 22 at the time, already graduated with my bachelor's. To reach out to a fully grown adult's father, a father I don't 
talk to, a father I've never hugged in my entire life, a father I don't have a relationship with, and who honestly scares me. He's a pastor and hosted an anti-LGBT protest for his church after he found out I was queer. He brought home t-shirts that my mom was so proud to show me that said, this is the true meaning of the rainbow with a Genesis quote on it. But imagine being so homophobic and having so much free time that you choose to interfere in a random person's family out of sheer hate with no regard for my safety or mental well-being. There are people who are killed in situations like these. But since then, social media hasn't been much of a safe space for me anymore. With my family constantly giving their unwarranted opinions on my content and my videos, my sister being like, sometimes I go on your page just to laugh at you, my mom telling me if I can't post quality things then I shouldn't post at all because nobody wants to see those disgusting videos. All because in one of my videos I said I want a girlfriend. And then when I call her out and I'm like, if I would have said I wanted a boyfriend, you would be like, oh, that's so sweet. And then she turns it around and talks about how much I've traumatized her and she can't even sleep with the thought of me ending up with a woman. And how horrifying it was this one time when a woman hit on her and asked if she was single and told her she was beautiful. To me, knowing her daughter was drugged and SA'd by one of her closest male friends. Like, I'm so sorry a woman respectfully hit on you. I couldn't come out on my own terms. This random man took away my safe space. And honestly, now social media scares me. It feels like a chore. I feel like I can't be as open anymore, especially because I can't post unscripted videos anymore. I have to spend days, weeks researching, writing, editing, reading my scripts over and over again out of fear that I'm going to say something wrong again. I'm just so paranoid. Also really frustrated because I can't make as much content anymore and it just takes so much out of me. And the thing is, I barely make any money out of this. I've been making like $80 a month. And like imagine spending so much time, weeks, making a script for a video for it to get less than a thousand views and no money. It just sucks because I'm disabled and I can't keep or work a full-time job. I burn out so quick and I'm supposed to be doing another six weeks of TMS soon. I just don't know if it's time for me to quit or if I just need to figure out how to get my life together. I started social media because I was alone in a different state and I didn't want to bother my friends constantly info dumping about autism and neurodiversity. But ironically, I have always hated social media. I didn't do this for followers, but now I'm in a constant state of fear and making myself feel worse by comparing myself to other creators who can just talk in front of a camera and make sense. Creators who don't have to spend weeks gathering and organizing their thoughts and still get millions of views and money. I'm just really struggling to see the point. I've been doing this since July 2022 and I'm contemplating just filming the rest of my scripts and falling off the face of the earth. And yes, my family is probably gonna see this and I've already said all of this to their face. I just finished Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. And instead of doing my usual book review where I just talk about the book, I actually want to read an excerpt from this book that I think really helps illustrate just how deeply ingrained racism is within our society. So this excerpt is talking about multiple studies done showcasing companies' discriminatory hiring practices in terms of race. Unfortunately, research suggests that bias can enter into the selection process at the very start of the search process. For example, economists Marianne Bertrand and Sandil Mullintathan conducted a study on hiring behavior in which they sent out close to 5,000 fictitious resumes in response to over 1,300 help-wanted ads in Chicago and Boston newspapers for jobs in the sales, administrative support, clerical, and customer service categories. The resumes were all similar, except that half of them were assigned an African-American sounding name, Lakeisha Washington or Jamal Jones, for example. And the other half had names more commonly associated with whites, such as Emily Walsh or Greg Baker. Then they waited to see what the callback response would be. The results showed significant discrimination against the black identified resumes, with white names receiving 50% more callbacks for interviews. The degree of discrimination was similar across job categories. Even federal contractors and employers with equal opportunity employer listed in their ads showed the same exact level of discrimination as other employers. In another study of hiring behavior conducted in Milwaukee, sociologist Deva Pager sent paired testers to apply in person for jobs that required no experience, just a high school degree. White applicants were twice as likely to be called back for an interview as the matched black applicants. Surprisingly, even white applicants who indicated that they had a criminal record received more callbacks at 17% than black applicants without a criminal record, 14%. In a subsequent study, this time in New York City, Pager and her colleagues fielded teams of white, black, and Latinx testers to apply for real entry-level jobs. The testers were all articulate, clean-cut, college-educated young men between the ages of 22 and 26, similar in height, 
physical attractiveness, verbal skill, and interactional style and demeanor. The Latinx testers were U.S. citizens of Puerto Rican descent and spoke without a Spanish accent. The testers were trained to present themselves in similar ways to potential employers as high school graduates with steady work experience in entry-level jobs. They applied for jobs in restaurants and retail sales as warehouse workers, couriers, telemarketers, stockers, movers, customer service representatives, and other similar jobs available to someone with a high school degree and little previous experience. In applications to 171 employers, the white testers received a positive response, an interview or job offer, 31% of the time. The Latinx testers received a positive response 25.2% of the time, and the black testers only 15.2% of the time. Stated differently, the black applicant had to search twice as long as the equally qualified white applicant before receiving a callback or a job offer. And it just continues to get worse. <laughs> In another version of the exact same experiment, the white testers presented themselves as ex-felons, having served 18 months for possessing cocaine with intent to sell, and were teamed up with both Latinx and black applicants with absolutely no criminal record. Whites with the criminal record of a felony still had more callbacks or job offers at 17.2% than did the Latinx testers at 15.4% and black testers at 13% with no criminal records. And it concludes going on to state that though the discriminatory outcomes were clear, few interactions between our testers and employers revealed signs of racial animus or hostility toward minority applicants. In the absence of prejudice remarks, would rejected black applicants even be aware that discrimination was operating without being able to compare the results to those of their white and Latinx teammates? Maybe not. But as these studies demonstrate, getting to the point of an interview is a higher hurdle for black applicants than white ones. Again, this is the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. This is one of the most comprehensively informative books on race, race relations, cross-racial dialogue that I have ever read before. I think it's very beneficial for anyone and everyone to read. It doesn't just talk about race within white-black relations. It talks about it from a Native perspective, from a Latinx perspective, from an Asian perspective, South Asian and Eastern Asian as well. It's just, it's like I said, extremely comprehensive. Ever notice that dogs only come in male and female? Actually, I do. But did you ever notice how humans operate on a different psychosocial level than most animals do? And have you ever thought about the fact that humans create psychological and sociological categories that animals don't? Also, we place sociological categories onto animals all the time. If you've ever spoken to a millennial or a white lady, you know this to be the case. Because Jessica is over here telling everybody that she's a dog mom. And at one point or another, most people have called their pets a good boy or a good girl. Animals just aren't capable of creating these categories for themselves. When Jessica refers to her Labradoodle, she's not talking about her actual child. She's not a parent in a biological sense. She has placed a gendered and sociological category onto an animal. If you read a lot of political nonfiction, this book will have been mentioned to you at some point. But not only does it fully live up to the hype, it has completely changed my ideas of geopolitics forever. And I'm going to try to convince people in less than a minute to check it out. A political history book in which the author painstakingly took the time to interview loads of people from around the world. This focuses primarily on the Indonesian mass killings of 1965, the US's role behind it, and how this was a decisive moment for them to establish themselves as the dominant superpower of the 20th century. The interviews in this book are so revealing but so disturbing, and yet it's so great to finally hear from people who have been silenced for so long. But what really struck me about this book is the way that we can look at history in quite compartmentalized ways. And the way that this book drew the link between Indonesia and Brazil as the decisive moments of conquest for the US completely changed my mind about geopolitics and the way the US actually came to be a superpower in and of itself. Cannot recommend it enough. Tired of being cucked by big transit? Does living in a walkable city keep you feeling miserable? If you're an oil-pilled pavement princess like me, check out 
San Jose, California. True Sisters of the Lanes will marvel at its unique regional expressway system, combining the speed of a highway with the access of a traditional boulevard, legendary routes such as Lawrence Expressway, Almaden Expressway, and Capital Expressway provide dyed-in-the-wool auto brains a way to escape the clutches of the public transit lobby. Unfortunately, the city does have a light rail system, the VTA, but it is one of the most underutilized public transit systems of any major city in the country. With only 253 boardings per mile, true parking lot queens mog on the VTA every chance they get. Of course, the gas prices in California are through the roof, but a real patriot embraces this opportunity to put more money in the pockets of our hardworking oilmen. The best part about San Jose is 94% of its land use is zoned solely for single-family homes, which makes owning a car almost mandatory. And don't forget downtown, completely cucked by a ring of highways, a skyline forced to get a low taper fade by the airport next door. What passes off as walkability is simply a way for soy-jacked liberals to feel good about themselves without actually selling their car. Besides, if you do feel the need to pretend you live in a walkable city for whatever reason, drive on out to Santana Row. Don't let its faux European facade fool you. This place truly is parking lot pilled. talk we finally shut them up always talking over those they only should obey they can't leave home too soon we lock them up in their room so they can think it over every time they misbehave but something shouldn't have to change it's how we both I can wear dresses and feel pretty. I'm a feminist and I wear dresses and skirts and pants or whatever makes me feel the most beautiful and confident. I'm not a feminist. I can actually cook. I'm a feminist. I can cook, but I'm not obligated to. I cook when I'm in the mood. You know who else can cook? My husband. But if neither of us have the energy or capacity one night, then we're serving frozen pizza. I'm not a feminist. I don't hate children. I'm a feminist and a mom and much more. I love my two children and I'm grateful to not be defined by them. I'm not a feminist. Thank you. I'm a feminist. Let's all just hold the door open for whoever comes in next. I'm not a feminist. And then people ask me if I'm actually a woman. I'm a feminist and I am so grateful for the women and men who have paved the way and continue to work for modern feminism where all people have equal rights and the opportunity to create lives and relationships that are unique to them. And remember kids, the next time that somebody tells you the government wouldn't do that, oh yes they would. The U.S. government isn't fascist yet. That'll only happen if Trump gets elected. Well, yeah, that's why MLK, Fred Hampton, and Malcolm X are still alive. Bro, tell me why when I'm sitting for the Pledge of Allegiance, motherfuckers start asking me, why are you sitting? Why are you pledging allegiance, bro? Get up and start start pledging allegiance. Stand up right now. Why are you sitting? Hey, bro, why am I sitting? Why am I not pledging allegiance? Maybe because I'm not a dick rider, bro. Like, you're low-key meat munching, bro. You are pledging your undying loyalty to a country you don't know half a brain cell about. Like, that is the, the, the tippity-top highest tier of dick riding. Talking about one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, because it's the fucking godly thing to bomb and blow up other fucking countries that have nothing to do with us. And by liberty and justice for all, you mean liberty and justice for all white Americans. 
if you are black and American, uh, there's no, there's none of that for you. And if you are anything but American, there's also none of that for you. Like, bro, you are putting your hand on your heart, pledging your undying loyalty while glazing it mid pledge. You're dick riding, bro. Pledging your allegiance is the most dick riding move ever. You're doing tricks on it. You're dip dodging and weaving on that shit, bro. It, it's creaming up in there and everything, bro. You're done for.